welcome back to Razmafsar TV, and uh, I'm very happy to have Bid back on our channel from Australia. Hi, Bid. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you very much. One of our subscribers asked uh, me to do a, 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 just an episode on steel bows, and I said, yeah, okay, I'm going to talk to Bid, and we're going to have a discussion on steel bows. So the first question which I have, steel bows. A very childish question because I normally don't like that. It's like someone asks me, is Shamshi better or Neze is better? I just say, what the hell is that, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going, you know, I don't like these comparisons. But I just, because we talk about cultures, but we are not going to concentrate on Asia, my country of origin as well, which is in West Asia, Iran. Mm -hmm. But we are going to talk in general across the world, for example, if they used any steel bows, because, you know, like in crossbows, right? It's a different me mechanisms yeah. I know. Is mm -hmm. steel suitable for making any type of projectile weapon, be it a crossbow or a bow? It's not an optimum material for performance, but its great advantage is it can be stored for long periods of time without deteriorating as long as it doesn't get rusty. So it had um, practical advantages in terms of both storage um, and you could check it quite easily. Uh, but in terms of range and things like that, not quite so good. So I think the maximum anyone's got with a, with a historical steel bow and I'm not talking about uh, the mid 20th century CFAD bows, is about uh, 200 yards, not meters. So maybe, you know, 185 or something meters. Yes. And that's, you know, for a bow, that's not very good. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, if you want a bow that you can keep strung all day, well, you can do that with a composite bow too, but not have to worry about whether it gets too hot or too cold or whatever, then steel bow is quite good for that and if you're only shooting at short range um then they are accurate the the one i have i've shot at a target and uh it's it's very accurate uh, it just doesn't shoot as fast or as far as a composite bow or even a wooden bow yeah. so uh, I, uh, I, uh, a wooden bow would outshoot a steel bow in terms of range an arrow speed. Just a then I have a very, very in, in, you know, a question I have is, okay, which I understand you're right, it cannot reach the range. Then why did Europeans use it for their version of crossbow? Well, there was a there was a, a development in Europe of crossbow design. They started out being relatively efficient wooden bows and then slightly less efficient composite bows but they were shrinking the bow size to make them more portable. They did the, to make an efficient crossbow out of say wood. Um, you, the bow is this wide. Yes. And they wanted bows that were only that wide because you could use them in castles better and things like that. So, and the other thing is what we were talking about steel hand bows is that uh, wooden crossbows and composite crossbows needed careful storage. And even though wooden crossbows, the bow part, the, the lap, was cheap, uh, you didn't want to have to go and make sure you've maintained them all. Because course, like a 100-year-old wooden crossbow, the bow would be useless. It would break within a, a day. Whereas a 100-year-old steel bow, you can still shoot it. Yes. So they were thinking in terms of storage, convenience, of of um of of size of, of profile the problem was that in order to make them work the way they wanted to they had to have more and more elaborate ways of drawing the string and the result is they became much more complex and inconvenient to use than the original crossbows they were replacing it, it's just one of those things the technology got to a certain point and took off by itself and uh I think people now can make a steel crossbow bow out of a cast spring. Yes. I mean, it's, it doesn't require the, the finest steel, and those bows work. 
And if your desire is to have a bow that works and you can store it easily, then steel bows are fine. If your desire is to outrange somebody, then steel bows are not so good. So um, the, the thing that's interesting is that, uh, and I think we discussed this when we were talking about aiming the other day, yes. Yes. that a crossbow stock blocks view of your target at longer ranges. Yes, we do. So therefore, a steel bow that can shoot uh, a heavy weight steel crossbow, like, you know, uh, over a thousand pound draw weight, Mm -hmm. that can shoot perfectly flat up to 90 meters is good enough and you know the heavy bolts the the kinetic energy is as high as a a, a, a heavyweight longbow or a heavyweight composite bow but you know you can you can you know just wind it up you don't need to be super strong Regarding or poundage B, regarding the poundage tell us something about the poundage a steel bow like on a crossbow can be made really strong with a heavy poundage, correct? As far as power yeah, of the uh, poundage. There's, there's yeah. references to bows um, that are still existing um, yes. from uh, from some of the uh, 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 ancient medieval uh, Italian cities that are used in, in target competition of up to 2,300 pound draw weight. And they only draw, the string is only drawn this far. So... Uh, the the average weights for probably the twelve to fifteen hundred pound draw weight uh, for bows that use the the goat's foot lever it goes down to you know five hundred to three hundred um, and a, a strong man can brace uh, a crossbow by hand up to about two hundred and fifty pound a strong man not me I have I have trouble at a hundred pound but. But you know, there's a lot of strong people around, and and uh, the the usage of crossbows, uh, in Europe was was quite amazing. So crossbow guilds, shooters guilds, were set up in various towns all through continental Europe, and they were part of the militia to defend cities. And uh, if you were highly enough thought of. You got a right. They had machines on the walls of the city designed to pull the crossbows back, and you could have the right to use that machine during the siege. <laughs> and it, 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 it's like a gas station. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of having to get your own thing out and wind it up yourself, you took it over there and they put it on a thing and it. <clears throat> I mean, it was a big um, uh, machine. I've seen that the, they still some of them survive. And they're massive. I mean, they're you know as as long as a, a as a a regular sized table about that wide, about that thick. Um, there's a, quite a few that have survived without all their parts, and it's a bit hard to tell what they really were. But once you see the old drawings and things, you realise that this is a machine to span a crossbow. Mm. So, um, now let's go back and move to the bows made uh, of steel. We have seen examples of that from India. Do you have you seen any other examples from Iran, Turkey, or Central Asia, Mongolia? There, there are there are European reports of steel bows, um, in in the Middle East, but there are no surviving ones that I know of. There might be in a museum in Turkey or Iran, yeah, that right. that hasn't been published. Yes. Uh, all surviving ones are from India, um. And uh, a lot of them were taken back as as keepsakes by British officials when they moved back to. I England. just wanted to say, you know, once an Indian colleague told me, "You guys are so lucky in Iran. Museums of Iran are full of artifacts, arms and armor, but in yeah. India, everything we have is in England." <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, there's there's a a um, radio program in Australia called "Stuff the British Stole." Uh, and it it goes through and lists all these you know amazing cultural appropriations that took place. Uh, the fact is though, um, it doesn't matter where they are, if your culture made it, it doesn't matter who owns it. It's your cultural property. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, I agree. And it's something you can be proud of if you're connected to that culture. Yes. Uh, so I, 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 the fact that somebody did it's the important part. Yes. My my feeling is that. Um, 
the concept of steel bows mm. was misinterpreted in some of the European reporters of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, because the only steel bows they knew of at the time were steel crossbow bows. And they under I mean, the English maintained a tradition of sport archery, but it was only the upper classes that did it. There was sport archery in um, in uh, France and Belgium as well, mm -hmm. on a small scale. Mm -hmm. But again, it was pretty, you know, uh, class stratified. Uh, so there wasn't a general understanding of archery in the population. So when people went to places, they wouldn't necessarily understand what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's I can think of one Persian painting where it may be a steel bow, and that is the um, Safavid painting of a youth standing holding a bow, and it's got a little inscription in Farsi saying Hassan uh, Arashi. Oh, so and I think he's wearing a Safavid hat under his turban and everything. But it looks like a steel bow. It looks too thin to be a composite bow. Yeah. So, But it doesn't say that it was made in Iran. It may have been imported because... There were lots of archers in Iran, and it would have been a curiosity to them yes. to see a bow that looked like a, a regular bow, but it's actually made out of steel. And it may, uh, in India, because of the very complex cultural, um, uh, you know, uh, structures there, where you've got lots of different cultures living right next to each other, you have in 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 uh, Sikhism a uh, a thing of having metal, all metal weapons, like all metal daggers and all metal swords and all this kind of stuff. And that steel bows are associated with um, secret tradition. I think there may be a portrait of Ranjit Singh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, holding a steel bow. He's certainly quite a few portraits of him holding regular bows because uh, they were very popular. You know um, what you said reminds me of one of my student, Indian students said, uh, she said, we were talking about languages and the the, you know, okay, the challenges, for example, which Spain is facing, because in Spain we have four languages, Gallego, Euskudi, Catalan, and Spanish. And then she mm -hmm. said, only four? I said, yeah, only four. I said, okay, she said, Professor, we have thousands of languages. I said, do you mean dialects? No, languages. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> over a thousand or two thousand, I don't remember, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's two huge language families. Yeah. Three. So you've got um, you've got the Indo-European languages, the Sanskrit and and Pali and all those that languages that led on to Urdu and 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 uh, Hindi. In the south, there's a huge range of the southern languages that are sometimes called Dravidian. Uh, um, you know, Canada and um, 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 Carnatic, all this kind of stuff. Then in the northeast, you've got all these languages that are related to the the languages say in the himalayas and into burma and places like that so when you put that together you've got three whole worlds mm -hmm. and that's not counting the little groups of people that live in the hills that have their own traditional languages mm -hmm. that are language isolates sometimes it's it's the linguistic map of india is amazing yes. um and of course a lot of these languages have long literate traditions yes. they've been written down for thousands of years and people have studied these writings for thousands of years so sometimes you get things like um the 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 the, the old the oldest book on archery in the indian cultural family uh the Tanu veda uh which Parts of which probably date back to, you know, uh, before the current era, but other parts of which have clearly been modified in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries because they start talking about things like firearms. And um, the that means that it's not like something that's just put in the library and for forgotten about. It's it's updated. It's it's a living tradition. Dhanu Veda has uh, things about stance and release and lots and lots of interesting things in it. So this is a, a live tradition. When it comes to steel bows, the problem is that 
there's little evidence before the Mughal period. The, the steel-making skill of Indian smiths definitely was capable of making steel bows earlier. Yes. They were t because you only have to look at their swords. And a steel bow is basically just two sword blades attached to a handle. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I almost have the scar to prove it. I was actually cut by one once <laughs> because the edge had got so thin and I picked it up and it just slashed my hand. I shouldn't have picked it up by the limb, but the person who was showing it to me was not and worried about it. You have also, also one example, right, of a yeah. steel bow. Am I correct? Yeah, I have it here. I've actually strung it up for the purposes of showing you what it looks like strung. Before we go to the steel and the, the how it feels, tell us about the string. What type of string does it have or did they have? They usually had strings almost identical to composite bow strings. So in India, there were several different types of bow string for composite bows. There were ones that had a gut core with a silk um, surround. Uh, yes. There were pure silk ones. There were ones made from other materials. This one is made like a standard uh, oriental bowstring with separate loops and that. I made this because when I got the bow, when I first got the bow, um, I didn't realize that it was still shootable. And uh, I, I was showing it to someone and they dropped it on the floor and it bounced straight up in the air. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, the steel and this is still, it hasn't lost its temper. You hear a lot of these, the the steel will lose its temper. Can I ask won't... you to do to do me a favor? Do you have a metal object which is not sharp next to you? Uh, I, I've got a, a a paper knife. Okay, thank you very much. Can you do me a favor? Can you hold the bow at one side, not in the middle? Exactly. Oh, oh, I I know what you mean. You meant like this. Okay. Can you just bang on it and it can hear? Actually. This is not this. The best way to do this is when I take the string off. So I'll take yes, the string off. Right. Here, it changes and it's the actually sound. Ring. When you when you just pluck the string. Yes. Can you hear that deep, deep drum? Again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got quite a deep thrum to it. Uh this. Well, I'll show you that the grip is more or less shaped like a spindle, but it it does definitely have a back and a belly. Yeah, that's so right. I see. Uh, and and you'll notice it's narrowed. Yeah. I'm holding this. Yeah. It's narrowed yeah. so that the the arrow pass is quite narrow. Mm -hmm. Um now a bow of this size normally would have a draw length of about 25 inches. This one's a little bit shorter. Um and I think it might have had a longer draw when it was younger, but it's a couple of hundred years old and I'm not gonna push it this arrow which actually is about the, is a model of a scythian arrow um it i can i can get this to full draw i'm not going to do it it's quite cold here and there's a tradition that steel bows are become more fragile when that when it's cold in hot yes. weather i i don't think i'd worry too much Yes. There's a lot of actual design features in steel bows that show that the people making them understood the dynamics really quite well. Oh, I might also point out, uh, this is a takedown bow. Mm -hmm. So it unscrews at the handle. Yes. Uh, no, when the strings on, I can't do it. There's a, it, it unscrews so that the one limb comes out. And you can just put it away in a small bag. Um, this is quite common. Uh, I've I've handled um, uh, steel bows that weren't made like that, but they tend to be highly decorated. And uh, there's there's um, in Pam's book on Indian archery, there's some photographs of steel bows that were associated with Mughal emperors, and they're elaborately decorated. I have seen a, a, a steel bow in a private collection in Australia where the whole of both limbs has gold and silver Kofgari work uh, with, you know, dense patterns of flowers and plants and things like that. So 
Uh, these came in a range of um, uh, styles from basic, which this is pretty basic. It did have Kofgari on the ends. You can just see them with a magnifying glass um, right up to something that an emperor would carry. Does it have any so, inscriptions on it? This one, no. I've mm -hmm. seen ones with inscriptions on them. And uh, and as I said, I think the the ones that uh, that uh, Dr. Pant um, illustrated in his book on Indian archery did have on the ears inscriptions saying who made them and who they were yeah. for. Uh, so just like you would on a composite bow. Yeah, of course. Um, as you can see, the steel is quite thin. Mm -hmm. I'll compare it. Well, I'm using my forehead as a background. Yes. Um, it's. It's this bow, the limb is lenticular, so it's thickest in the middle and thinnest on either edge. Uh, the I'm just the the ear, I don't know whether this will show up, is forged mm. in one piece with the limb. Yes, I can see that. I can but see that. this is not always the case. Often the ear is a sep each ear is a separate piece and it's riveted onto the bending part of the limb. And sometimes the handle is also riveted on. This one is forged in one piece, not the whole, but the each limb is forged in one piece. Um, and the 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 um, takedown mechanism is a screw and the screw is hand carved. It's not made on a machine. Uh, so uh need just one example before I forget. I know it's out of context. Maybe you can don't remember. I just when was the first screw invented? That's very interesting. Um, uh, the Archimedes invented a, a pump, and the mechanism was a screw-shaped tube that was on a uh, axle. Yeah. And when you rotated the axle, water was moved up the, the, the screw shaped tube. So the concept of the screw goes back to that, but it wasn't a screw in the sense we talk about screws. Screws were largely popularized in Western Europe, starting in the Middle Ages, when they started making them for various things, and then progressively... Uh, when gunpowder came in, they realized screws are perfect for holding guns together because you yes. could then take them apart and clean them and everything. And of course, clockwork. Um, the original clockwork didn't have screws, but then screws were seen to be really useful. The funniest thing is like screws were very uncommon in China. But the earliest use of screws I've seen, this is my, me personally has seen, not not that anyone has seen, because there'll be Chinese scholars that know a lot more about this, Manchu quivers, the two tightening bolts that hold the mouth of the quiver closed, usually with screws, with little wing nuts on Give the us back. a period, please. Oh, we're talking about uh, 1670s to 1910. And the early ones definitely had this system. So I've seen one from, uh, I think, uh, Chen Lung, which is in the 1700s, definitely had screw fittings. Mm. So uh, they, you know, screws weren't used in other things, but at some stage, now bearing in mind, this is after European contact with China. So they may have seen them in guns or in clocks or, and the, the Manchu emperors collected European clocks. They loved them. Um. So they may have seen the mirror and thought, hey, we can use these in quivers. They didn't think, oh, we can build machines using them. And they thought, ah, quivers, something important. Uh, and uh, I, I was I was really surprised. When, oh, wait a minute. I have seen an earlier screw in Chinese. I, I with the help of some Chinese friends, uh, produced a, an article on a warring states. This is, uh, it was about 250 before the current era crossbow yeah. and uh this was a, a a repeating crossbow where you you held it and you pulled back a, its tail and two arrows would drop down and when you got to full length the two arrows would be shot out and then you'd push it forward again and another two arrows would fall down this did actually have a screw fitting in it and i think it may have been only a wood screw one of the bronze pivots 
that the locking mechanism sat on, I think had a screw on it. So they may have known about it, then forgotten it, and then it was reintroduced. Uh, but the real um, champions of screws were, uh, and nuts and things like that, bolts and nuts, were the Europeans. And uh, I, as I say, I'm not sure which area it um, it spread from. Now, I can find out because I've got a book that I think covers that. Uh, and um, it just, we take it for granted. Everything is held together by screws, unless certain computer manufacturers like gluing things together, but everybody else is using screws. Uh, and uh, so a lot of things didn't need screws, so they didn't have screws. Yes. And I mean, we've got to the stage now that we have screw and arrow points on arrows. Yes, yes, which, exactly. Which nobody in the past ever thought of. Uh, it's a brilliant idea. I use them all the time. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say that the antiquity of the screw as a concept goes back to um, Hellenistic times. Uh, their functional use started to spread in the Middle Ages, and then by the Renaissance, they were everywhere. If you look at, like, Da Vinci sketchbooks and, and some of the um, other notebooks that people prepared, uh, you see screws everywhere. Actually, now that I think of it, one of the most archery-related um, uses for screws was one of the early crossbows that had a very powerful bow had a screw built into the stock which attached to the um, the firing mechanism, the nut. And what happened was there was like a a, a handle, like a tap and at the end of the stock. And to draw the string back, you turn this handle and it gradually pulled the string back using a screw going through a fitting that pulled the whole thing back. And that also may have been the mechanism of those uh, crossbow machines on the walls that were for stringing people's crossbows. They definitely used screws in those wooden screws, big wooden screws, like, you know, that round. But yeah, so screws um, have a, a long association with archery in terms of crossbows. Um, and uh, they have a slightly weird association with quivers as the Manchus had had worked out this system. This is to close the quiver mouth so the arrows didn't rattle because the Manchu arrows were very long and well, the quivers yes. were very short. I mean, I've, I've got mm -hmm. I've got one here. Mm -hmm. And um, as you can see, um, the, the very long arrows in this are, in fact, about the equivalent length. There are two little things here, and this is where the screws would be. I didn't have screws when I made this. So I made little knotted leather thongs to go through to tighten it all up. But that tightens up the inside of the quiver so that the arrows don't rattle. So, yeah, uh, I mean, it's... Um, I didn't think that would come in useful tonight. Uh, the, the, yeah, so it's, it's, not a, it's not really that strange. Oh, the other thing that's really fascinating, there's a folding... They call them assassin's crossbows, but um, they would executive toys for rich people in in the renaissance there's a folding one when you fold it out it's a little torsion catapult and the mechanism for drawing back the nut is a screw mm -hmm. and this is i i think this is 15th 16th century but it's a, it's a collapsible folding crossbow <laughs> it's about that big collapsible um Regarding the steel bows, I mean, did they use these type of bows ever in warfare? Yeah, I think so. I think the advantage of these bows is you can keep them stored strung without too much trouble for quite a long time. And in defense of interiors of buildings, yes. you don't need the range, but they can provide hitting power, particularly with heavy arrows. Um, in... Uh, uh, they were they were actually used in hunting too, I believe, from from what I've read, because they kept some in howdars of elephants, and mm. I think I have seen some paintings from India showing people hunting with them from horseback, close mm. range, but I mean you know, 
Uh, there was a period when composite bows became rarer because long range shooting was had been taken over by firearms. So from the 1650s onwards, composite bows declined, yes. uh, firearms took over, but steel bows started to appear more regularly and possibly they're the equivalent of a pistol. There's something you can just shoot really quickly. Um, the other thing that Kay Coppedra um, wrote about was that uh, in, in South India, they were used for training youths in archery because a steel bow is really hard to break. <laughs> and, <laughs> and kids are very playful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can yeah. do damage with one of these. But, but yeah, they were, and, and they started off, they didn't even start off with a thumb draw. They started off uh, as... If I remember correctly, I ha I'd have to look up the article, but they started off with a with a pinch draw like that. Pinch draw, yeah. Yeah. Now you, this bow is too powerful to do that with, unless you're a rock climber or something like that, and you've got super strong hands. I'm not. Um, my exercise is typing on a keyboard, which isn't isn't it doesn't give you strong hands. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they're, they're um I, I would think uh, yeah. certainly the Sikhs used them in warfare. Um, and I think through you, much of the Rajput areas, uh, Rajasthan um, and places like that, and, and Rajput groups moved all over India, so there'd be, you know, lots of places. But South India, which is, you know, like, uh, I think was in the Tamil-speaking part. I will have to look up the article because uh, Kay wrote a quite good article on this. And it was stuff that I'd never heard of. I mean, you know, she actually went and talked to the people. Yeah. And and therefore she had direct, yeah, you know, people who had been trained as kids, mm -hmm. because archery training wasn't just for warfare. It was like with us; it was a sport. Um, it was considered good for your, you know, development, yeah. just as archery is to us. I mean, archery mm -hmm. um, improves your concentration and your your physical skills and things like that. So it's a good mm -hmm. reason to do it. Um, Pete, uh, just uh, uh, one more uh, question regarding these. Uh... Bows. I mean, so they are tempered. They're made of steel. They're tempered. Yep. They're forged to yes. shape, most probably, right? They're forged. Yeah, yeah they're all forged. Yeah, yeah. Forged I've seen shape. ones where they've assembled them in five parts. So you had a handle section, uh, two flat pieces of steel as the limbs, and then two forged pieces of steel riveted or or forged welded onto that to be the ears. Have you uh, seen and that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you seen any examples of steel bows made of patterned crucible steel or patterned welded steel? I've seen a, a crucible steel one mm. with gold inlay. Uh, mm. You know, you know, the inlay method used on swords. Um, mm. So not kofkari, not where you cross-hatched it and you hammer in the... This is inlay. actually... Yeah. Um, a beautiful watering in it too. I'm trying to remember where it was. Uh, may have, I'd have to check. It might be in the Grayson collection. Um, but whoever owned it knew about watered steel, so they had it. It had been properly etched, so it it, it was a, a delicate grey pattern on the steel. It wasn't, you know, you know. Sometimes people do um, pattern welded or mechanical damask is what my friends used to call it. Um, uh, sword blades. Or dagger blades, and then they etch it for too long, so there are deep grooves in it, which is nobody in the past did that because they wanted a functional knife, and they didn't want one that had grooves in it that would fill up with blood that it would dry, and then it'd be hard to clean or anything like that. So um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I'll, it'll come to me eventually, but yeah, this was a beautiful piece of watered steel. It was clearly functional. Um, but it was also a very high status object because you don't make things out of watered steel unless they're really important. Of course not. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it was it was never cheap. No. That's why in uh, Persian, in Persian, they called um crucible steel goha. It means yeah. jewel. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, it's um, about, it's next okay, they called also gold jewel. So gold, silver. Precious um, stones, semi-precious stones, and crucible steel. 
when you read yeah. that Gohar Name, you know, one of my books, then you realize yeah. how expensive this thing is, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or was. When, you know? when you when you see um, some of this stuff and, and you realize just how much work goes into it, yeah, and and how effective that. So you rarely see watered steel weapons that are not efficient. Yeah. Because why waste it on something that's just meant to look good? No. And uh, I mean, I've I've got a few watered steel swords. Um, one quite large one. I think we discussed it once. I've got a Ferengi that instead of having a European blade, which is why they're called Ferengis, um, uh, it actually has a watered steel blade this long. Uh, Wood's blade. And uh, I mean, we when I bought it, I didn't know. I just wanted to own one of these swords to find out how they felt in the hand and all that kind of, and what their balance was like and everything. When I took it out of the scabbard and cleaned it, I realized I had the longest water steel blade I'd ever seen. And um, and it was very simple. So this was a, a case where somebody could afford water steel, but they couldn't afford a, a sword maker who could put in fullers and do all that kind of stuff. Well, maybe they didn't want it. Maybe this is what they actually wanted. The problem with swords like Ferengi's and Kanda's is usually the hilt can be taken off very easily and replaced. And this has a really old hilt that is rusted thin. I mean, it's not rusty, but there's holes in the metal where it's it's corroded away. And um, so you, you don't know. The blade may have been part of a, a, another set of swords, uh, you know, like um, a higher grade one. I mean, you know, you, you see it black watered steel where this the watering is so dark and it polishes so impressively because it's integral to the steel as i say yeah uh, water steel bows i've seen maybe two the the ones that are covered in kofgari and that you can't tell this mm -hmm. one i've never tried to etch the surface maybe i should clean it up and and just do a little patch etch to see what the steel's like inside. I would imagine that uh, mechanical damas, that is where you beat out the layers, you could use that construction method to get more even, more controlled um, bending in the steel. It wasn't until, you know, like the 18th century uh, that the, the kind of industrial um production of high quality spring steel that was was very you know predictable uh was possible i mean this is when europe started exporting swords to india i mean the indians rehilted them as indian swords but their local um production wasn't high enough for the number of people that needed swords um so there's lots of european blades in india they just reshape the edges and and improve them to what they wanted, um, but the I don't know I don't know if like the bows that were made in five pieces whether those strips of steel were imported steel or not because I didn't have a close enough look uh, at the time because I didn't know about I mean I saw these things thirty years ago and I did not know enough to know what the right questions to ask were. Another so, uh, question I have a uh, bit: um, Did they use regular, regular arrows for steel bows, or did they have their own type of arrows? My feeling is they just used uh, uh, heavy, normal arrows. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I've got Indian arrows where they're so heavy that their only purpose is to punch through armor, right? They've got big steel, water, well, sometimes watered steel heads that are shaped to punch, punch a hole through armor. And that type of arrow shot out of one of these bows would be effective in reasonably close range. Uh, these bows were never going to shoot a long way, but the, the using a heavy arrow maximizes the amount of energy transfer so therefore their effectiveness um the thing is uh the bigger versions of these or this if it was more um as i say if i was more sure of it uh there are 26 25 26 inch arrows in indian collections and in my collection too 
which I feel, since they're very heavy, now one of the things that a short arrow is quite useful for is if you're shooting at very high angle, um, a short arrow is quite useful because the same arrow when you were shooting like that, yes. you can't draw because it's it's just too short. Well, yes. it's possible that if you're shooting for distance, a short arrow is very light. Mm. If you're shooting for impact, it's very heavy. And I have a couple of really super heavy um, Indian arrows that are maybe uh, a fist width shorter than a regular Indian arrow. Most mm. Indian arrows, like issued military arrows, are round about between 27 and 29 inches long. 27, 29, okay. Mm -hmm. Because people uh, drew here and they were, a lot of them were not much taller than me. Uh, uh, excluding people of Jat origin like Sikhs and, and Rajput origin who were all taller than me. But back in the day, nutrition wasn't quite so good. And, you know, they grew tall uh, when they got good nutrition. I grew fat. When I got good <laughs> but yeah, I think that in general speaking, uh, they were regular arrows, um, but they were just at the heavier end of the regular spectrum. I mean, I've got Indian arrows that are target arrows, possibly for like you remember the hecky targets that uh, yes. uh, where you had you shot an extremely long distance, mm. and these arrows are you know like six millimeters in diameter and incredibly light. I've got a war arrow that's six millimeters in di diameter and it's much heavier. Mm. So uh, two Indian arrows would look exactly the same. You pick one up and you say, oh, that's heavy. Mm. I mean, the 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 widest diameters I've seen is about uh, uh, eight millimeters. Mm. Yeah, eight to nine millimeters. Mm. You rarely see them much bigger than that. Um, um I have another question. Do you know anyone who makes reproduction of these bows, steel bow? I've seen what were clearly reproductions going around the antiques market pretending to be old. Um, and if anybody made them, it would have been one of those companies like Worldwide Arms in India, which made reproductions of lots of different weapons. They actually had some really highly skilled Kokgari people working for them. So often you would see a modern reproduction of a dagger but the the silver work on the blade or or on the handle would be of such high quality as yes it's, you know yeah. so so it's not that certainly in india they didn't lose the ability to produce high quality um in um there's a a type of uh, of uh, like a pewtery type metal called uh, that's used in bidri wear and they still make flasks and all kinds of this used to be quite common for sword handles in india and um so i mean not that they didn't also make them out of steel and and i i've got a um, jambia um made in india uh with a uh, a woods blade and the handle you know the jambia handles like that mm. is made of two pieces of watered steel um uh, hard soldered together, braced together, yeah. so that the whole dagger, handle, and blade is wood. Mm. Mm. Bid, now just another question. I think this will be then our last question. Then I can ask you if you have anything to add. Would you recommend people who start archery to start with a steel bow if they find the reproduction? I hate when people use antiques. Imagine they yeah. find the reproduction. Do you recommend that the that the use a steel bow? Not really. I think that uh, you, you get much better performance out of fiberglass bows. Yes. And you can make them look more like, you know, more developed bows. Uh, there, was a, there was a fad for steel bows made out of tubular steel sections in a longbow form in the 1950s and, and uh, before the full, full development of uh, mm. fiberglass wood composites. Uh, made in a lot made in Sweden. I think CFAB was the company. They were notorious for getting um, stress fractures. So you'd shoot them for so many hundred shots, and then all of a sudden, one of the limbs would break. Oh god! 
and they cause serious injury sometimes. I've seen people with antique ones saying, oh, I'm going to shoot this, and I'm going, don't do it. It's old. The steel is probably not performing the way it used to. You're really taking a risk for you and the people standing near you. This type of bow with flat limbs is much more stable. But you, everybody knows that if you've got a piece of metal and and if you can bend it, if you keep bending it, it will break. It will break, definitely. So if the bow isn't well designed, if the bow bends too much in one, uh, I'll, I'm not worried this is going to break, but if it bends too much in one place, then that place, whether it's there or there or whatever, is mm. eventually going to break. Now, what they would have done with these in use is they would take them to the blacksmith and he would heat reheat that section and retemper it and it would have a, a new lease of life. But we can't do that normally no. because we don't have the skill. It's just that it's going to be really expensive. So just go and buy a fiberglass bow. It's easier. Mm -hmm. Just another question. You said we're going back to the bow. The the handle of the bow is screwed together. Did I understand you correctly? Yeah. Oh, look, I'll take the I'll take the string off and show you if we've got enough time. Oh, that would be nice. It's uh, uh it's gonna play games with me. Okay, I'll we'll take the string entirely off. Mm -hmm. As you can see, see one of the things about these, the people that made them knew not to try and make them look like unstrung composite bows because it would be a total disaster. Mm -hmm. Now I got I. Ah, oh, it's that in. Ah. Okay. So true screw mechanism, correct? Yeah, this is a proper screw. I'll, I'll hold it up to the camera once I've got mm -hmm. it undone. Can I see that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, I can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously this means you can store it. Actually, this is a good time. And the other the, one you can unscrew as well, right? No, no, this only unscrews on one side. But a lot of on bows unscrew. Yeah. On one now side. let's let's find out what happens when we hit it. Wait a minute. I'll I'll suspend it. Mm -hmm. No, that's yeah. not. I'll suspend it the other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, these are, these are. Actually, when you feel it, you, it's like holding a blunt sword. Mm -hmm. um, these, as when I first got this, uh, I, I handed it to a friend and, and I let go too early or he didn't grab it. And it landed on the floor like that. This hearth landed on the floor and it bounced straight back up in the air because it's, it's a spring. You know, as a martial artist, I could say that if you don't have anything else, someone gets close to you, attacks you, you can use it like a... Like a blunt, you know, force. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, you know. And, like, I, I mean, it, it's not radically heavy. Yeah. But if you struck somebody with uh, with the edge of it, of or course. if it was fun and you, you struck them with the um, the tips. Yes. The, the tips are majorly small. Look how yeah. narrow they are. Yeah, they are. And... Uh, when you look at this, this is actually a good idea for making um, fiberglass wood composite bows. So not having that big, thick area, ridged area, but having it all bending, but with this part small and very rigid, because that's in incredibly rigid because it's, you know. I, I, I often think, I, I've seen bows made with similar construction by um, Harry Drake. Uh, the famous um, flight archer, and I think one of those bows was used in the in the flight shoot where they shot um, hand a hand bow. They shot well over uh, what is it now eleven hundred yards, something like that. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, you know, it's a good design. The people that made these bows understood bows. They weren't just oh let's make a copy of a bow they said now admittedly you could probably make a better steel bow yeah. because steel isn't really good for these type of curves 
but mm. for a bow that looked like a composite bow and performed reasonably well, it's a really good compromise. At the end, do you have anything else to add to our discussion today to steel bows? Well, first of all, there's a lot more types than this. Um, this is just one type. I was looking at, there's an article in the Archer Antiquaries Journal by Doug Elmy in 1969, and he has like a whole line of different shapes. He divides them into five groups. Solid steel bow, steel bow with applied pieces on the handle to make the hand grip nicer. Steel bow that unscrews like mine. Steel bow that unscrews into three parts and five part steel bows. So there's a lot of variety. It's a worthwhile area of study. And if somebody wants to make one mm. following these old techniques, you should be able to make a bow that's not quite as good as a fiberglass bow. This is a pure mm. fiberglass bow, but not so bad as a badly designed fiberglass bow, if you know <laughs> what I mean. So uh, think, it's it's a good area of study. I think I think people that are interested in uh, metallurgy could contribute quite a lot to our understanding. By um, thank you very it. much, Bean. I wish you a nice day, and thank you for coming to our channel again. My pleasure, as always. Bye.